The Dallas Mavericks upset the Phoenix Suns in the second round of the playoffs behind the individual brilliance of Luka Doncic. And it's time to dissect how Luka was able to be so dominant as the offense completely revolved around him. I'm going to show you the patterns in his offense, as well as the main culprits with the defense that was so confounding to Monty Williams, he couldn't seem to adjust at all, allowing Luka to elevate the Mavs all the way to the Western Conference Finals. First, let's look at which defenders he scored most of his buckets on. Remember, it's not necessarily the guy that starts out on him since the Mavs offense was forcing switches on many possessions. I charted every one of his made buckets and this is how it sorted out. DeAndre Ayton was the main target and he did it equally from distance and in and around the paint area. In game one, the Mavs quickly realized that Ayton wanted to drop way too far in his pick and roll coverage. And while Lucas shot pretty poorly overall from three, you never want him to feel this comfortable. Before we study more of his three-point shots, I want you to see how detrimental this drop coverage was for allowing Luka to get downhill and into his floater game. It's easy to see why Monty would be upset at Ayton's effort when you see plays like this, allowing Luka such a wide open shot from the elbow. But then, he'd get caught in no man's land, not pressuring the ball at all, nor is he in position to stop the lob to Powell, giving Luka the easiest of runners off the glass. Watch how Luka uses his big body to crash Mikhail Bridges right into the screen. With no support due to this drop coverage by Ayton, and more importantly Luka going to his left, which is an easier shot for righties, Luka knows he can get this shot whenever he wants. Ayton makes the slightest adjustment to get almost on the level of the ball screen, then try to lure Luka into an inefficient mid-range shot. Luka is too smart for that and Ayton doesn't seem to realize that all of Luka's step back threes are to his left, where he gets plenty of room to release and splash. By this point, it was good to see Ayton finally stepping up to add a little pressure off the switch on the ball screen, but they had already let Luka see a bunch of threes go through the net, plus it's really easy to hit deep balls when you're up by 35 points. But what makes Luka so hard to guard is how destructive he is from everywhere on the court. More Aiton defense as they force the switch on the handoff and drive and kick. The Mavs quickly realize they've got a mismatch on their hands, spread the floor with three shooters in the perimeter and Powell in the dunker spot, and watch as Phoenix offers absolutely zero support for Aiton on the blow-by. They should have put an additional defender on the block and zoned up the backside to limit Luka's scoring options and make anyone else beat you. Again, a simple pick and roll gets CP3 behind him, and Ayton gets so worried about Powell rolling that he jumps out of the way of the ball, giving up the finger roll off the glass. The double ball screen across the top still has Ayton's man being the second screener to ensure the matchup the Mavs want. I don't like that Ayton is standing straight up here and isn't prepared for Powell's quick screen in the lane that allows Luka the easy layup. It simply was too easy for the Mavs to screen for Luka, and if the switch didn't happen, just screen again until Aiden had to guard Doncic. With the floor spread so well, it would be hard to rotate to help, and even though this is a shot the Suns will live with, Luka can make these often enough for it to be a problem. In Game 5, Devin Booker seemed to poke the bear with this fake injury after a hard foul, calling it the Luka Special. And I remember at the time wondering if that would come back to haunt him. Well, let me tell you. Based on Luka's numbers in games 6 and 7, it seems like Booker is going to have nightmares about this for a long time, and the only solution to the guilt he might have felt is to use Calm, the number one mental wellness app that gives you tools that improve the way you feel. It can be like meditation, or just a way to take a deep breath and let it out. It's important to find your center so that you can perform your best, and Calm can help. They even have daily movement sessions designed to relax your body and uplift your mind. I love the soothing voice and music by Harry Styles that helps me fall right to sleep, and you need to check out all their calming content. If you go to calm.com slash bball, you'll get a special offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription with new content added every week. Calm is ready to help you stress less, sleep more, and live a happier, healthier life so you could game plan a lot better for Luka Doncic. Another example of how easy it was to force a switch quickly and then spread the floor. Good shooters in three spots, plus a lob threat in the weak side dunker spot. Aiden does a decent job to stay in front, but at the very end, he swivels his hips to react to Luka's jab step, 
and then freezes for a second as the ball is lifted into the shot, allowing an open jumper. This time, they force a switch with four shooters spread behind the three-point line. And with a drive into the middle from the top, there simply is no help rotation they can afford, and Luka hits his patented turnover the right shoulder fadeaway from 13 feet. Mikhail Bridges was the next most common target since he guarded Luka the most, and you can see how Luka's physicality abused the thin forward to no end. He struggled to deal with the punishing screens properly, and Luka took advantage. In Game 7, he scored four times on Bridges, as he seemed to relish the matchup with such an elite defender. But Luka gets plenty of space on his step back to the left, that even with freakishly long arms, you're not going to swipe the ball clean, which leaves Luka with a completely clear view of the rim as he drops this one in. Early on, they caught him in a long closeout, and they were so concerned about letting him have an open three that a simple gaze at the rim allows an easy blow by, no one rotates to help, and the route is on. And it was clear Luka's severe weight and strength advantage could be used down low in the post, as Bridges tries to lean on him, but the spin to the baseline gets him a little awkward finish. Luka got another post up on Bridges in Game 3 that showed his physical advantage, but I want you to notice that the Suns had no interest in doubling him to stop the score from point-blank range. And I get it, Luka is an elite passer with incredible vision, and the Mavericks have shooters that can easily make you pay for leaving them open. But when you have such a heliocentric offense that relies so heavily on one man to make plays for everyone else, it would seem logical to make anyone else beat you. I went through every single possession when Luka was on the court, hunting for examples of the Suns double teaming him, and it was pretty amazing how few there were. And sometimes I had to be a little generous to even consider them double teams since they weren't very forceful and didn't seem planned by the coaching staff. I counted 8 possessions where the Mavs actually scored or got fouled off a Luka double team, and 18 possessions where the Suns got a stop. The sad thing is, 7 of these total double team possessions occurred in Game 7. Meaning, Monty Williams decided to do this way too little, way too late, despite evidence that it was working. In Game 1, as the shot clock wound down in campaign dealing with Luka's size, Shamit doubles, and you can see the Mavs are completely prepared with Green waiting to screen Aiden from rotating to the corner. The irony on this play is that it's Spain pick and roll, the play the Suns completely abandoned in this series, despite it working so well for them. Check out that video here. And while this wasn't a planned double, Luka feels the presence of two defenders on him and hits the back screening Bullock open for the layup. In Game 3, the Mavs again were prepared for the double as Finney Smith flashes to the elbow, but the Suns rotate back perfectly until Booker's awful closeout allows Brunson to abuse him at the rim. And here's the best example of why it's tough to double Luka, especially out top. Crowder jumps him, but then gets frozen when he has to turn around and identify where to close out to. The pass is there too quick, the shot is off in a second, and Monty must be thinking, I can't double this guy. However, the evidence of defensive stops off of double teams is abundant enough to make me scratch my head why he wouldn't have mixed them in a lot more. I really like how Booker jumps him in the post as Luka is turning his back, and this time Green doesn't do a good job pinning Aiton in the lane, so he gets out to contest into a bad miss. It was good to see JaVale offering some support to Bridges down low in the post. Even though it's not even a full double team, McGee is mobile enough for a strong contest of a three into a miss. This was a great double team out top, forcing Green to be the playmaker in the middle of the floor. While this did give up an open three, at least they forced Bullock to put the ball down on the ground and sidestep before letting it go. They almost never doubled off a pick and roll, and I think you have to show him this kind of a look from time to time, as Aiton's aggressiveness really pays off at a key moment in Game 2 that enabled the Suns to take control of the game. Another perfect defense with Spain pick and roll keeps Luka at bay behind the line, and even though you could argue it's not a real double team, Bridges shows an extra body in space and lures the pass to the corner into an awesome steal. While some of these double teams yielded open shots, you'd still take your chances over Luka controlling the entire possession. I just don't understand why Monty didn't unleash Aiton more to aggressively force him backwards into corners. I'm sure they'd love to see more of Dorian Finney-Smith hesitate before shooting threes. Booker again throws a late double team at him as he's preparing to shoot out of the post, and look how it catches Luka in the air with no choice but to throw it away. Again, they hardly ever doubled him when the ball screen came, despite a bunch being set close to the sideline, and I know this is a good shot, but you'd much rather have Kleba attempting these than Luka having his way in either a layup or an open three. 
In Game 7, they finally started springing more double teams on him, and you can see the Mavs are prepared with that screen along the baseline, but had Bridges closed out normally instead of trying to deflect the corner pass, they wouldn't have had to deal with Finney Smith being a dribble drive artist earning free throws. And it was completely frustrating to see Booker wholly unprepared for that baseline screen, despite the Mavericks doing it whenever the double team came. He doesn't even try to get around it, and Brunson hits a wide open three. But look what happened when they doubled him with Aiden off the pick and roll near the sideline. For this play, the same thing happens, but they even get the steal and run out. But at this point, the series was over, as the Suns' offense didn't show up, and it made sense they simply weren't going to rotate with enough energy and precision to stop the Mavericks' offense. Make no mistake, Luka is a singular force in the NBA, worthy of MVP consideration if he could ever begin a season in shape. And he's also a battle-tested veteran forged in the pressure cooker of the EuroLeague Finals. And it's exciting to see him shine like this, but also confounding that the Suns would not adjust their defense hardly at all and allow him to lead the upstart Mavericks into the Western Conference Finals. <laughs>